but it's been transformational for me. Thank you. Other uh, observations on do, be, do, be, do? Well, I think uh, just one observation. Um, without uh, allowing yourself to be in the sense that you were talking about, um, you don't allow yourself to appreciate what's uh, in front of you, the people around you, etc. You know, I find that a real problem in my own life, and um, um, I'm glad you brought that up. And I think, in a way, that's the essence of contemplation. It's it's a kind of appreciation of of what's around. Right? I think uh, I was talking earlier about the breath. You think of how many spiritual traditions do contemplation by means of the breath and the gift of the breath. That this is not something I don't think. Oh, I've got to take another breath. It just it is of our being to do that. And that uh, the air you're breathing out, I'm breathing in right now. So we are connected. And the interdependency of air, I mean, on and on it goes. The ecology of air. These things are all part of that. Uh, you, you know, Buddhism calls that mindfulness. You know, the, the being in this moment and attending to these very basic elements that are not of our making, but are a, the gift of what we receive and take in and give in any moment. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, at this juncture, I have so much in my head, I don't know if I'll be able to say this uh, coherently. But first of all, I want to be devil's advocate and get us way back to that, to the connotation of the word activism, the grandiose, you know, collective joining of energy in order to form some kind of movement to create social change, but just for the temporary definition. Now, I want to also bring up a past history, the history of the resistance in, uh, in World War II in France. Now, faced with something like that, people have a choice, many choices one could argue, but you could keep making your breadsticks and milking your cows, or you could join the resistance if you knew the implications of not joining the resistance and take up arms if need be or blow up tracks. In other words, there are times where action is absolute. Collective action is are vital. <clears throat> now, the next concept is comfort zone. There are people like me who are uh, natural born fence sitters. <laughs> I find millions of ways to procrastinate because, partly because, in the 60s in the States, there was a lot of rhetoric. I lived in Berkeley, I lived in San Francisco. There were, there were all kinds of things being spouted, especially by the Black Panthers. I had interactions with them which was horrific. They were the closest thing to Nazis that I'd ever run into. I, I'd sat in places where, I, I won't go into it, all right? And so I saw in collective action there's a lot of flakes and a lot of uh, fervent uh, people who get into the violence that they're trying to work against, and I've witnessed it, been part of, close to it. So it's helped me sit on the fence. However, I think this is a point in time, for example, like other literature I get, I get it from Amnesty International, I get it from Suzuki Club, I get it from the Sierra Club. Most of all, I feel this whole business, for example, about global warming is for real. So if I don't do anything, I'm a member of those group that stays in their comfort zone, and I, I mean, I meditate, I have all kinds of quote-unquote spiritual practices, but I think I need to join with these like-minded people who see the urgency of collective action about certain matters. And we're missing that here. We're missing that. And, um, for example, I believe in reincarnation. If I come back 60 years from now and see that Bangladesh was flooded, I'm going to say, holy shit, I was one of those guys, those assholes who sat in the fence and sat in their seat and did nothing. So, pardon me, but, you know, I think you need both. And a couple of quick footnotes. In Buddhism, it's the same as in Islam. They believe in the efficacy, and in Christianity, the efficacy of thought. And in the 60s, we used to read about these high, high lamas who were actually sitting and being centered in Tibet prior to the communists, who were balancing the world, who were cosmically, they were getting such a high state. This could have been mythos, you know, of the 60s. But we don't talk about it here, but there is, in my view, 
a good versus evil thing happening, which you run into. I could talk for an hour about that. Cosmically. And that is, gets back to contemplation as well. See, it is a paradox. You need to do both. We, I, I need to do both. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. And I think at that point we're going to have to uh, bring this to a halt. Um, uh, with, uh, after 3.30. And um, I just want to uh, uh, start here by thanking Professor Coleman so much for animating this discussion. I also want to thank Steeps for um, hosting us and providing all these refreshments. And, um, and then I want to remind you, in case you don't already know, uh, that we're having another cafe in two weeks' time on Saturday, the 5th of se uh, February, right here, of course, same time. Um, the title of this is a question, who is happiest of all? And uh, we've got a very uh, interesting uh, uh, animateur here, Mark Anielski, who has written a book on the economics of happiness. So... We're going to be discussing what I termed uh, two weeks ago the, the subjective side of, of the excellent life, as, if there is any such thing as the excellent life. And um, uh, that's um, going to lead, I'm sure, to a very interesting discussion, and I hope you'll all come back for that. Thank you very much. Oh, one more. oh wait, wait, wait. David has one more. Next. I'd be remiss in not uh, inviting you, if you are able, to uh, Augustana on Monday evening at 7, when um, Daniel will be speaking on reading, spirituality, and cultural politics. So it's 7 o'clock at Augustana. It's in our little program here if you're interested. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Daniel.